It's easy to take new ideas for granted. The reason for this is simple. Whether I'm watching a movie, reading a book, listening to music, or playing a video game, I'm only getting the end result, the culmination of a whole lot of work condensed down into a single experience. It's easy to forget that these experiences didn't need to exist. At any point during their creation, they could have become something entirely different or even been cancelled outright. Nintendo may be a company known for some of their creative and out there ideas, but it's uncommon for them to create an entirely new IP and game world. Most of their games stem from franchises that have their roots back in the NES, Game Boy, or SNES. For this reason, brand new IPs from Nintendo actually tend to excite me more than entries in pre-existing series. The GameCube had one big new IP developed and published by Nintendo. Pikmin. The closest thing I can compare it to is an RTS, but that's not quite right. In those games, the player typically controls their troops through the user interface. This way, the player needs to consider the limitations of each type of unit they control. Meanwhile, the user interface is meant to act as an extension of the player's thoughts and desires. In Pikmin, the player controls their troops using Olimar. Unlike a well-designed user interface, Olimar is pretty limited. He can only move so fast. He can only be so specific when instructing Pikmin. He needs to be physically present to get anything done. But these limitations add a unique element to Pikmin. Now, when the player is strategizing, they need to consider both the limitations of their troops and their player character. In a lot of ways, Pikmin is defined by limitations, like the time limit for each playthrough, 30 days. Each day lasts only 13 and a half minutes, except the first day. That day you can just dick around. Another limitation is the controller itself. Look at this thing. Does that look like a mouse and keyboard to you? Nah, it doesn't allow for the pointing and clicking and hand cramps we've come to know and love. But when actually playing the game, this doesn't feel like a limitation. Nintendo knew what they were doing. They didn't design the game and then try to slap a control scheme onto it. It seems like they designed the game with the controller in mind. So when Pikmin are in Olimar's control, they follow him around automatically. Using the C-Stick, the player can manipulate the Pikmin's movement. This way they can charge enemies, dodge obstacles and hazards, and sing a cute little song. Yet another limitation is the Pikmin themselves. Like well-meaning children, they'll listen to you, but sometimes they turn into idiots. Some of them will trip and fall. When they get dismissed, they'll start attacking crap. When they run by sprouts, they'll latch onto them. Similarly, the time limit is one of the game's most defining features. The game gives players more than enough time to collect everything. But the idea of failing an entire playthrough is a bit stressful. On a first playthrough, the player has no way of knowing how long it will take to get everything. Still, once Pikmin is completed for the first time, it's clear that, though the game is exceptionally punishing, it's also exceptionally easy to complete. Either way, the first playthrough is imbued with a sense of urgency. As such, the player is likely to rush headlong into danger. They'll constantly explore, find new things, tackle new challenges. The time limit also encourages players to engage with the game's mechanics to multitask, figure out optimum routes through the levels, and so on. On repeat playthroughs, the time limit serves as a way for players to challenge themselves. After all, the leaderboard at the end of the game communicates an implicit challenge. Go faster. Lose less Pikmin. Do better. So, though the time limit's function changes on repeat playthroughs, it always adds to the gameplay. Now, with most games, the more I play them, the more glaring their flaws become. What were once minor inconveniences can halt a playthrough mid-progress. Sometimes it leads to the realization that, no matter what, that first experience with the game is gone. The realization that no subsequent playthrough will be quite as great as the first one. Pikmin's the opposite. I've beaten it four and a half times. The half there is a playthrough I'm still working through. The first time I played it, I enjoyed it but found it unexceptional. Pretty good, but that's it. Nothing more, nothing less. The second time, it was good. The third time, really good. The fourth time, great. Without fail, I enjoy it more each time I play it. As I mentioned a bit previously, the first playthrough of Pikmin relies on engaging players through exploration and discovery. In total, there are five areas to explore, each of them packed with enemies and environments to interact with. Most areas in Pikmin are aesthetically similar. Really, the only one that stands out as particularly unique is the forest navel, with its dark, shadowy, cavernous feel. Even so, each area is a pleasure to run through. The core of this somewhat realistic, natural aesthetic is strong enough that it's kept my interest through multiple playthroughs. The music adds a lot too. Most of it is relaxing, composed of plucky, playful melodies, sleepy, sustained synths, or robust, rhythmic percussion. The music also changes as time passes, reflecting the threat of nightfall. Additionally, when Pikmin fight, more percussion get added into the mix. Of course, this mimics the Pikmin hitting other creatures. The use of orf instruments, such as the xylophone and marimba, gives the music a childish tilt. 
It adds to the sense that the Pikmin need a leader, that they too are rather childlike. Beyond all that, some of these pieces are truly beautiful. Despite the looming threat of death, they imbue the world with an almost therapeutic, relaxing atmosphere. Look at this water. Don't you want to go for a swim in the distant spring? It looks so, so nice and re refreshing and oh, 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 my voice! Each area introduces new enemies. On a first playthrough, this makes every encounter a bit spooky. Could this guy kill all my Pikmin? What's its range? How fast does it move? How many Pikmin do I need to kill it? The only way to answer these questions is to put your boys to the test. And if you play things too safe, maybe it'll cost yourself too much time in the long run. But if you run carelessly, well... Of course, it's always possible to restart the day if anything goes too wrong. In that way, the game isn't quite as punishing as it initially seems. This also makes it totally possible to run through the game in less than 15 days on your first time through. Still, it's easy to grow attached to these little guys. Leading them to their deaths is stressful on a very basic level that a simple reset might not remedy. Look at them. Their cute designs, their playful humming and singing, their excited squeals. All of it makes me want to protect them. Then there's the fact that they're useful to the player. This way, the player feels a connection to them. The Pikmin need them, and they need the Pikmin. It's a rare sort of connection with characters in a video game. My only complaint about enemies and the creatures in the game stems from the bosses. There just aren't many of them, and even then, one of them gets reused. While that's a bit disappointing, they still work well as slightly more frightening enemy encounters. The only boss I outright dislike is the final one, the Emperor Ballblax. His attack patterns are simple and repetitious, you'll get them down pretty quickly. His chunky health bar is the only reason he presents any real threat to the player. I'd much prefer if he had a smaller health bar. Alternatively, he could have more attacks, and the fight could change as it goes. That way, the fight wouldn't drag on. However, this is a rare instance of the game dragging on. For the most part, it moves at a fairly fast pace. And that's because the game does a great job of introducing players to its mechanics. Very few things are obviously tutorialized, and even the stuff that is can be skipped quickly. Instead, the game counts on the player using their brain to figure things out, or it lays levels out in a way where the player is forced to learn crucial mechanics before moving forward. For example, when the player gets plopped down in the Forest of Hope, there's only one way out of the landing area, through this white wall. Even though the Nintendo overlords didn't outright tell the player what to do, they'll eventually figure it out. More complex aspects of the game are introduced just as well. The impact site begins by giving the player a series of tasks to complete collect and pluck Pikmin, use them to push this box, then collect the ship part. The order of these tasks is set in stone. There aren't any options here. The second area, the Forest of Hope, starts off similarly but opens up fast. Now there are multiple ship parts to collect, multiple paths to open and take. On top of that, yellow Pikmin and bomb rocks are introduced, along with a slew of enemies. This leads to a question. What's the fastest way to do this? The player will only figure that out by experimenting. They'll need to figure out how many Pikmin are necessary for each task, and which task can be completed together on a given day. Still, there are only so many options in the Forest of Hope. Many ship parts in both boss encounters are blocked by bodies of water. As the player doesn't have blue Pikmin yet, you can't get over there. The third area, the Forest Naval, is where things really open up. My first time through, I found it overwhelming and I did not enjoy it. Now, it's my favorite area in the game. Once the player finds the blue Pikmin, this area is entirely open. The player can do anything in any order. Additionally, the layout makes things more complex. See, the forest navel is structured like an Audi. The middle is the highest point. The player can drop down from there to get to any area, but getting back up either requires going all the way around or making shortcuts. Now there are more questions. Which shortcuts do you open? How many of them? How long will it take to open them? Should you clear out the enemies, or can you make shortcuts that bypass the enemies entirely? Because of the many options presented, this area requires the most experimenting but it's also the most satisfying to complete quickly. Enemies are amped up here too. If the player screws up, some of them are capable of wiping out about 50 good boys in a second. The fourth area, the Distant Spring, features more powerful enemies and a whole lot of water. Since water Pikmin are weaker than fire Pikmin, this gives the player two options. First, bring the stronger red Pikmin with Olimar. This way, the player has more firepower. However, this also means that the player will be stuck running back to the onion to get more Pikmin or they'll need to leave a lot of Pikmin sitting around doing nothing. The other option is to use a large amount of blues. This will make it easier to go fast, but it means that these already stronger enemies will be even more powerful. The ship parts are also generally further apart than in the other areas, meaning that there's more ground to cover. 
In addition, this is the only area that has a fully exposed landing area. Enemies can and will wander over to the onions and assault these fresh fellows. There's even one enemy that will come over, roar, and pull all the Pikmin out of the ground, killing them instantly. Honestly, I much prefer the way that the forest naval digs into the game's mechanics through multitasking and planning things out, but the distant spring is still a good area in its own right. The final area, the final trial, is a lead up to the final boss. It's short, but it's a microcosm of the game as a whole. First, multitasking. Second, killing the enemy. Third, collecting the ship part. Here, novice players' skills will be put to the test. However, other areas of the game are far more difficult to complete quickly. As such, what's a pretty solid end to the adventure on the first playthrough is a lot less interesting on subsequent playthroughs. I have yet to grow bored of traversing any of these areas. There always seems to be some way I could speed up my playthrough, some way that I could do a better job of managing my Pikmin. Before going in for a new day, I found myself writing out my game plan. I would write down how many Pikmin were needed for each ship part to be carried, I noted any obstacles, hazards, or Pikmin type restrictions in my way, I looked up speed runs, I went from completing one task at a time to looking for as many tasks to complete as possible, and while I still don't consider myself great at the game, getting that 13 day run, it felt like a real accomplishment. Really, my only big complaint with Pikmin is that I wish there was more of it. Personally, I think it would have been great to have a randomizer type mode. In this mode, the ship parts or enemies would get swapped around. Where the regular mode is about perfect time management, this one would be about thinking on your feet. But if my biggest complaint about a game is that I wish there was more, well, that must be a pretty great game.